earliest statements of the Christian faith? Of course, the creed itself was drawn up long after the time of the apostles, but we can say that it has all the stamp of apostolic authority. Christianity is based on a revelation from God that we find in Scripture, and Christians found that when they needed to give a public declaration of faith, for example, when they were being baptized, there was a need for an agreed form of words. And so it's really a summary of the early Christian beliefs. It gathers together the very fundamental facts of the Christian faith and expresses them very, very simply and crisply and clearly. So here's a good foundation and a syllabus for teaching and for the understanding of our faith. In other words, it says, look, here are the major themes of Scripture, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. That helps us explain what the faith is to other people, but also enables us to go back to Scripture and trace these themes for ourselves. If you like, the creed is a superb learning aid for Christians. These words, these short sentences about God, about Jesus, about the Spirit, and about us, encapsulated um, in shorthand form almost uh, what they knew was the faith that the earliest apostles had themselves taught. One of the factors that led the early Christians to realize the need for creeds was that the Bible could be interpreted in different ways by different people. And in the first two centuries, one of the things people discovered was that the Bible was being interpreted in some very strange ways by people. There was a real need for a public, authoritative interpretation of the Bible, something that would be absolutely faithful to what the apostles intended. And one of the reasons why the creeds came into existence was to give the church a public statement of its faith, which was absolutely faithful to Scripture, but also which could be protected from distortion by heretics. And so this is the way creeds originated in the beginning, to instruct new converts, to um, nurture the believers, and also to protect the church against uh, false teachings. Before people got baptized in the early church, uh, they would have gone through a process of instruction. This is not at the time of the New Testament church, but subsequently later. Uh, and uh, they would have gone through what many churches do today by way of instruction in the faith. And it was used as the basis of those what were called catechumenate classes. The early Christians, they were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And with these th threefold baptism, in fact, probably originally threefold immersion, uh, together with that would be three statements, three questions about the Father, about the Son, and about the Holy Spirit. The candidate would be asked questions. Do you believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in his Son, Jesus Christ? who was crucified and rose from the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? By the end of the second century, however, instead of answering questions, the candidate for baptism would make a positive statement. I believe in God the Father and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit. The opening words of the Apostles' Creed uh, say, I believe. Uh, every human being believes something. None of us get through without a framework and a basic set of values uh, and assumptions and convictions on which we base our lives. I remember some years ago visiting a monastery in um, northern Greece and uh, we actually went up a stairway onto this high, high mountain where the monastery was. But until they built that stairway, the only way up into the monastery was in a basket on a rope and they used to winch people up and the basket would come up supported by this one rope. Now, if you want to know what the early Christians meant by believing or by having faith, it was what you have when you get into that basket. You believe that this rope is going to hold you. You trust your life to it. This is the thing that's going to get you up there and it won't break, it won't let you down. And it's that kind of trust of utter reliance on something or someone that the early Christians meant 
when they talked about believing. So one of the great themes we find in the creeds is that God is one in whom we can trust. Belief is a statement of experience. Uh, I think we, we tend to get things backwards. We, we think that you first believe and then you may or may not experience something. I think for the, for the apostles, experience was primary. Then they begin to try to explain the reality of that experience to those around them and to, to lead others into that same experience of God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So that, to me, this is the essence of, of the Christian faith, is the experience of life with God in Christ animated by the Holy Spirit. So what you believe about God affects the sort of trust that you can have in God. And it was because the Christians first inherited a belief about God as the creator and the God of justice from the Jewish people, and then because they saw that lived out in Jesus, God as creator, God as the God of justice who would put everything to rights, because they believed that God was like that, they knew they could trust him with their lives and with their whole eternal future. And so believing what they did about God enabled them to trust God. And so the Christian word for faith or belief was born as both a statement about God and a statement about how I trust him. The creed itself derives its structure from those, that verse at the end of St. Matthew when Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we are confronted here by a strange paradox, something that cannot be entirely explained in logical terms that we can only really begin to understand through prayer. Sometimes we have to stop using words and just to be silent before the divine mystery. What we find from the earliest Christian writings we have, namely the letters of Paul, is that even when Paul is trying to say, there is one God, it keeps on coming out in two or three ways. He talks about the Father and the Lord, or God and the Son and the Spirit. There's one wonderful passage in Galatians chapter four, which is actually full of Exodus language, so it's going back to the book of Exodus, um, like so much else in the New Testament, when he says that when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman born under the law, and then because you are God's sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are now no longer slaves, but children and heirs of God. And then he immediately says, now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, how come you're turning away to pagan-style deities instead? This is Galatians 4, verses 4 through 8, 9, 10. In other words, you've got a choice from the very earliest days of the church. You are either going to go with the God who you've come to know as the one who sends the Son and the one who sends the Spirit of the Son, or you're going back to some form of paganism. And that is the beginning of what we Christians call Trinitarian theology. But God is experienced as three distinct persons, equally and fully God. But he is the Father, and he is the Son whom we see in Jesus Christ. And then after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, he is the Holy Spirit whom we still know at work in our world today. And the Holy Spirit makes Jesus real and alive to us, the teaching of Jesus, and it is Jesus who is the mediator, the divine agent to connect us sinful human beings to the Father. That is, of course, mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing in the first century and it's mind-blowing still, but it's all because of Jesus that they had to differentiate between Father and Son and Spirit. And in a sense, that remains the glorious central task of all Christian worship, as well as theology, uh, to explore and elaborate and celebrate the threeness as well as the oneness of God.
Unsurprisingly, the opening of the creed deals with what Christians believe about God, the Father. We use images like Father or, or what have you um, as a means to try to get a handle on the reality of God. Of course, we can't do that. We cannot encompass God within any human frame of reference or any system of, uh, of symbols. And so we begin with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And this word Father, I think, is very important. To say that God is Father is uh, 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 an amazing claim, uh, which has all sorts of practical implications in our lives. We don't believe that the world is run by an impersonal force. We don't believe that it's the outworking of just uh, physics or astrophysics. Uh, we don't believe that fate rules our lives. We don't believe that the stars govern our lives. We believe that there is a personal God who made us and who loves us, who is in charge of our lives. It's reminding us that God is the one who brings us into being. And more than that, that God as Father is one who cares for us, as, for example, an earthly father would care about his children. So the idea of God as Father is immediately setting up this idea of a God who can not simply be trusted, but a God who can be known in a personal way. The first time in the Old Testament that we discover God being called Father, it's actually said the other way around. God says to Pharaoh in Egypt, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Therefore, let my people go that they may serve me. And then often looking back, from uh, later perspectives, the Jews look back at that time and say, surely you are our father. So the idea of God's fatherhood in the book of Exodus is very closely bound up with the fact that God has been secretly nurturing this family all along, and now it's time to act. They believed, because Moses came back from the desert with this message, that God was their father in this sense, that the one who'd made the world and was in covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ancestors, had now heard them in distress, crying for help, and was coming to rescue them. Then again, developing out of various Old Testament passages, we see the idea of Father both as creator and as nurturer, as the one who brings his people up. Um, some lovely passages um, in the Old Testament which speak of, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. This picture of the father teaching the little boy to walk and then grieving that the boy then rebels against him when he grows up. And so it's deep rooted in the Old Testament. And though our human experience of fathers may be tainted, uh, may be disappointing, many of us had great fathers, uh, but not all have experienced good fatherhood humanly. We shouldn't project our human experience of fatherhood onto God, but rather understand God is the unique, brilliant, ultimate, excellent model of fatherhood. It's not as though we've created God in the image of our fathers. On the contrary, the idea is that true fatherhood is a reflection of the fatherhood of God. God who is loving, caring, compassionate, all those things that we would want our fathers to be, and yet many people would have to say, my father wasn't like that. But when I look to God, I come to God the Father, and I find there somebody who does understand me because he made me. He understands me because he even knows my thoughts. He knows my thoughts from afar off, as the Old Testament scripture says. That's a wonderful thought, that he actually knows not merely what I look like, not merely how I feel, but he knows my very thoughts. And that means he instructs, he guides, he provides, he cares, he corrects, he disciplines, and ultimately he has authority over us, all within a very personal, intimate relationship. Well, of course, the creed begins with the words, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Almighty, uh, omnipotent, the Latin actually is uh, um, omnipotentem, which, which of course is, is, is so literally omnipotent. Almighty basically means that God is all-powerful. There is nothing outside of God's power, God's might. Like most 
early Christian words. That word goes back to an ancient Jewish word, which means God, the all-powerful one, God who has the right to do whatever he wants within his world. That can carry very pejorative images. Uh, it can carry images of, of a tyrant, uh, of someone who abuses power. But we must not think of this in human terms, in the terms of a fallen human world, where power means often constraint and violence. Remember the creed says, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty. He is Father before he is Almighty. God preeminently is love. God is love. And so his great power is always exercised in behalf and in the service of his love. He is almighty in his love. And there is nothing more powerful in the universe than humble love. So when we talk about God as almighty, we often think in the modern Western world at least that this is quite an easy concept, just means God can do whatever he wants. Well, yes and no. Can God make a square circle? You know, it's a contradiction in terms. And often when there are things that we rather wish God would do, why didn't God step in and stop the Holocaust, for instance? Why didn't God step in and stop 9-11? If God's all-powerful, why did he allow these things to take place? And part of the answer is, tragically, that God is compassionately involved with the world that he made in the state in which it now finds itself. And so God has to act from within and that his power, as St. Paul says, is most perfectly revealed in weakness. And that is a deep paradox which is at the heart of the Christian faith. And it's a, another way of saying, if you want to know what it means to say God is the Almighty Father, look at his Son and see how God's kingdom came through the death of his Son. The strictly logical conclusion from the idea that God is Almighty would to negate my will. But one has to put against that the other truth that is proclaimed over and over in Scripture, that God has given to us a freedom of choice. We do not have absolute freedom. It is a limited freedom, but it is sufficient freedom. What the Scriptures teach us is that God created us to find our perfect wholeness in a relationship of loving union with God. Now, the, the operative word here is loving. It is not a coerced relationship. This is a love relationship. But a love relationship requires that the beloved be free to say no to the relationship. If the beloved cannot say no to the relationship, it's not a love relationship. It is a master-slave relationship. It is a coerced relationship. So God has created us for a love relationship which implies within that creation the ability to say no, the free will to say no to the relationship, to genuinely say no. Here is the incredible condescension of the creator of all to put within our hands the possibility of defying the creator of all. The creature might rise up and shake its fist, our fist, my fist, against the one who made me. It seems incredible, but this is the biblical story. It's the way the story begins back in Genesis. The theologians call it the fall. God having made us in his image, and as the scripture records, relating to Adam and Eve with freedom and without any barriers, so it is like when a composer composes a beautiful, wonderful piece of music. If people are playing it badly, he doesn't say, oh well, forget I ever wrote that, I'll write you another one which will be easier for you to play. He needs somehow to teach them to play that piece of music, not because he isn't the great composer who is actually almighty over the music, but because he is. So he's got to work from within to enable the healing of the world to take place. First of all, we must recognize that although God is the creator, we live in a fallen creation. That one of the consequences of, of humanity's turning away from God is a fallen creation. And the consequences of a fallen creation, I think, are the kinds of things that we see in floods and earthquakes and all of those kinds of dynamics.
God is present with the human creation in tragedies like this. That God is, God's cruciform love is present with every hurting person, with every person who is wounded for, for those that have lost loved ones, for those that have lost property. God is present with them. God is present in their pain. God is present in their grief. God is present in their sorrow. This is part of what the cross reveals to us, that God is a God who enters into the depths of our woundedness, of our brokenness, and God is present there with us in it. I'm comfortable, I'm healthy, I'm well, because I'm in perfect harmony with the law of gravity sitting here. When I step off the edge, if, if I'm on the roof, okay, when I step off the eave of the roof, does gravity suddenly become punitive and vindictive and retributive? No, it just keeps on being gravity. And I experience in my own life the consequences of stepping out of harmony with it. When, when humanity steps off the edge of the roof spiritually, when we turn away from that relationship with God, that relationship of loving union, does God suddenly become mean and vindictive and punitive? No, God just keeps on being the holy God in whom our own wholeness is found. And we experience in our turning away, both individually, collectively, corporately, we experience the consequences of trying to live our life contrary to the spiritual laws of our nature. God has created us in such a way and I spoke earlier of those, those structures that God has put in place, those reliable structures. But part of the reliability of those structures is that if we choose to set ourselves in opposition to that reality, there are inherent consequences that are beyond our control that we're going to experience. And to, to blame that on God, I think, is faulty logic. It's the consequences of our own experience. Christians believe more about God than simply that God is a Father who can relate to us. We believe in a God who does certain things as well. And so the Creed goes on by talking about believing not simply in God the Father Almighty, but a God who is the creator of heaven and earth. Not just the world as we see it, but the world of space, the world that's too small for us to see, the world that's too big for us to see, the invisible spirit world, the world of our emotions, which are not susceptible to eyesight, all this he created. And here we find a very important statement, not simply about who God is and what God does, but who we are. It's reminding us that we are dealing with a God who brings everything into existence, including us. That's an amazing claim and one which has very distinct impact on the way in which we live. We are responsible to God for the creation. We are not the owners of the creation, rather we are its stewards and we must give good care of this creation because it is God's and not ours. It's his unique gift to us, wonderfully resourced and it's not for us to, to damage it or destroy it by the way in which we live. He is Lord of this creation. By implication we have a rejection of pantheism. God made the world. God maintains the world in existence. Without God the world could not exist. But God is also above and beyond the world. So there is no separation but there is here a distinction between God and the world. He made everything that there is uh, and that he made it out of nothing that he wasn't constrained by having to um, work with some recalcitrant materials, but he just made it uh, as he willed. And um, out of nothing, he's the sole creator and it's all his. This has all sorts of practical implications. Um, one implication is that if, uh, as today many believe, um, atheistic evolutionists, um, the world we live in is purely a sort of random product of, of something which has no meaning at all, then there is no meaning in life. And strictly speaking, there's also no meaning in our thought processes. They also are just random um, product 
Now, of course, Christian theology makes a very important point that humanity alone is made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, there is something about humanity which sets it above every other aspect of creation. He has made us to be uh, maybe lower than the angels, but uh, higher than animals and people with the capacity to relate to him and have creative significance like him and moral wills that animals do not have. And so it puts us on altogether a different plane. So humanity is part of creation, not divine, part of creation, but at the same time is raised up over and against the rest of creation. Humanity has a special place in that creation. When scripture says he made us in his image, it's in the context of saying male and female he made uh, m men in his own image. And there is a sense in which that implies that we were made for relationships, not as cold machines, but as people to enter into intimacy and depth of relationships. Be made in God's image somehow means to have the, the capacity or the ability to relate to God. There is something about us. We are made in such a way that we are able to relate to God. There's some kind of similarity, not an identity, but a similarity between ourselves and God. He made us in his own image. He made us to resonate and to relate with himself. So we are incomplete without relating to him. So in the Apostles' Creed, we very clearly are saying everything is created by God. Any form of dualism is being rejected. We are not to imagine that God created some things and another power, the evil one, created other things. Everything is created by God. Sin exists and evil exists, but these were not created by God. God created a universe that was good. It is we human beings who have misused our free will who have in this way brought evil into the world. There is a multiple explanation, I think, as to where evil comes from, and we can't easily track it down to one particular thing. One day we may know more about the origin of evil. The important thing is today not to track down its origin, but to recognize its existence, and even more importantly, to know that whatever, wherever it came from, God has given an answer and a solution for it to be dealt with. If my house catches fire, it may be helpful eventually to know what caused the fire. But the most important thing is to put the fire out first. And God cannot be faulted on giving us the means of putting the fire out. The second major part of the creed moves on to talk about God the Son. The real focus of the creed is on Jesus. When you go through the creed, you'll find that there are, by my count at any rate, there are 24 statements of what I believe. And 14 of those are concerned with Jesus. And here we find the creed trying to express in a nutshell the very complex and very rich Christian understanding of the identity and the significance of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Why is he so important? God has revealed himself uniquely uh, in Jesus. The God who has spoken throughout the Old Testament now speaks not through prophets, not through visions and dreams. He comes as a human being. Jesus is the human name of the second person of the Trinity. The name that he was given at his human birth in Bethlehem. Jesus was uh, a, a popular personal name. Christ is not a proper name. Most many people think that it is, but Christ describes the office or ministry of Jesus as Son of God. Christ means the Anointed One. Our comprehension of God is, is just blown out of the water. Okay? What seemed to be impossible in terms of the ancient philosophies, even to the Hebrew mind, becomes reality in this man, Jesus of Nazareth. His name was Jesus. 
Christ was not the name he was given. That is a title that, that faith attaches to Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is the Christ. Christ means the Messiah, the Anointed One. And of course in more recent times people have taken to saying Jesus the Christ, which really is more accurate to our original sources in the New Testament than Jesus Christ. Uh, it's very interesting to see how often, for instance, Paul speaks of Christos, Jesus, Messiah, Jesus, uh, although it's translated Christ Jesus, but Paul is emphasizing Jesus as, as the Messiah, as God's anointed one. This Jesus is God incarnate who's come here to be the Messiah, the anointed one, to die for the sins of the world. For example, take the end of John's Gospel. In John chapter 20, we have this remarkable encounter between Jesus and one of the disciples, Thomas. Thomas says that he will only truly believe in the resurrection when he sees the wounds in Jesus' side. He then sees them and he confesses, my Lord and my God. And what the creed is trying to do is to say, this is what Christians ought to believe about Jesus, that this is our response, not just Thomas's response, that in some way in encountering the risen Christ, we are encountering someone who we have to recognize as none other than our Lord and our God, none other than God incarnate. And we know that he is pre-existent before the world because he was with the Father and through him the world and all things were made. St. John tells us this in the beginning of his gospel. We are affirming that he is God from all eternity, that he is equal to the Father, that he is God in the same sense that the Father is God. Colossians 1 says of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That is taken in the sense of the heirship. He is the heir of all creation, and in him are given all of the inheritance. Same thing in Psalm verse two, uh, Psalm chapter two. I think it's around about verse eight, where the Lord says, uh, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Well, what is meant by that is I've produced you, I've presented you to the people as the heir of, of everything. Part of the problem, of course, here, as with much theology, is that we're straining at the borders of language. And that's not something to be ashamed about. Um, if we could simply put all this theology into a test tube and cook it up and see it, then it wouldn't be theology anymore. It would be chemistry or physics or something. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised that our language gets stretched to the limit. But that should make us humble and reverent um, because we're actually treading on very holy ground here. The creed affirms that Jesus Christ is our Lord. He may have been a human being and he may have been a saviour, but there is more to this Jesus than, than that. And uh, one of the earliest affirmations, the Apostle Paul refers to it in 1 Corinthians, is what distinguishes us as Christians is the affirmation we say Jesus is Lord. When they're calling Jesus Lord, they're actually upstaging Caesar. They're saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. That's why Paul gets put on trial in Acts chapter 17 for saying that there is another king, namely Jesus. And it's clear that this is seen as a threat to the Roman power. And to make him Lord of Lords and Lord of all, as the New Testament does, puts him not only over against the human power of Caesar, but far over in superior terms to that. I'll give you an example. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11, Paul says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. At that point he is quoting from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, where it is Yahweh who says, To me and me alone, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Well, it's been said that uh, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. There's no point calling him Lord, Lord, and then ignoring when he says, now I want you to do this. Take an example way back before uh, at the early days of the Second World War, a group of uh, German uh, Swiss theologians uh, devised together the Barman Declaration, and in it they 
affirmed that Jesus was Lord and that they were, as Christians and as a church in Germany, answerable to no one else but to Jesus as Lord. So they were not bound to go down the road of obeying Hitler, as many Christians did in their compromise, which led to all sorts of evil and to the uh, onslaught of the Holocaust and the evils of Nazism. Uh, declaring Jesus to be Lord frees us, uh, dramatically in that case, from having to bow down to any other lords who are going to serve us ill in comparison with the way in which serving Christ will do. So the Lord means you're surrendering your life to him, but in surrendering that life, uh, you're not putting yourself under the way you would to a dictator, a, a, an earthly king, a totalitarian ruler, a tyrant. You're giving it to somebody who serves you. But it means we identify with Jesus, who uh, was a servant of all, who uh, put aside his own wishes and desires to serve us and to save us. We, we think Christ-likeness is alien to our humanity. It's, it's as though God is trying to impose something on us from without. When, when in reality, Christ-likeness is the essence of what we are created to be. Christ-likeness is the essence of our wholeness. And so what God is doing in Christ is, as I mentioned earlier, is, is entering into our alienation, into our separation, into our rebellion, into our deadness, into our darkness, entering in cruciform love in order to restore us in that relationship for which we were created that divine human relationship, that we are to be in loving union with God, that that is our wholeness. You can believe all things about, all sorts of things about Jesus. The question is, is he Lord? I believe Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need to declare Jesus is Lord. Materialism is not Lord. Fashion is not Lord. Image is not Lord. The political powers of today is not Lord. Even democracy, good idea though it may be, is not Lord. But he reigns supreme over all. Then the, the creed advances to describe, now what about this Jesus? What did he do? What, what do we believe about his life? And it begins with the question of the Incarnation. He is going to have to come and take upon himself the humanness which the human race has now caused itself to be. In other words, this decaying and dying thing in order to exhaust the power of that decay and death by taking it upon himself in order to bring about new creation. At the Incarnation, he emptied himself, as St. Paul says in Philippians 2. He became incarnate. That does not mean he ceased to be God, but in his earthly life, his Godhead was hidden, hidden under the veil of the flesh. And so he did not lay aside his Godhead. That would be a wrong interpretation of Philippians 2. But he agreed to, as it were, restrain its revelation and its use. So he accepted to be humiliated, to be vulnerable, to be weak. And he was obedient even to death. God will come and will take its woes, its pain, its death upon himself. So incarnation is absolutely central to the whole Christian message. St. John's Gospel tells us that the Word became flesh. And that means that we are dealing with a God who doesn't remain distant from us, but who chooses to enter into our history in Jesus Christ in order to redeem us. It's saying that Jesus is not simply a great teacher, not just a great prophet, but rather that in Jesus we see God 
entering into our human situation in order to deliver us from it. If I could put it like this, God entered into our world to take us into His world. He came to where we are to bring us to where He wants us to be. The Incarnation is all about a God who enters into this world to bring us safely into the New Jerusalem. Jesus is uh, uh, the unique Son of God and the phrase that highlights the uniqueness uh, in the Apostles' Creed is that he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. When Christians in the Creed say that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary, they are reaching for human words that deal with mysteries that are beyond us. But when we've said that he was born in the way that every human child is born, came into the world through his mother's womb, the phrase born of the Virgin Mary emphasizes uh, the other side of the coin uh, to the phrase conceived of the Holy Ghost. Here is the human angle on the birth of Jesus Christ. From a divine angle conceived uh, by the Holy Ghost, from a human angle born of a virgin. In Matthew's Gospel, a story about Joseph being told that um, his, his wife is to have a child conceived by the Holy Spirit. In Luke's Gospel, a story about Mary being told um, that she is going to have a child that way. So Matthew's Gospel sees it from Joseph's point of view and Luke's Gospel sees it from Mary's point of view. That's interesting for another reason, which is that those stories are quite clearly not derived from one another. It isn't the case that Matthew has read Luke or Luke has read Matthew and he's just produced a different version of the same tale. They're quite different stories. So clearly from very early on in Christianity, there was this sense that Jesus' birth was, Jesus' conception was different. And the other thing to say about that is you can search back in Judaism for prophecies about a virgin birth, if you like. The closest that you get is one in Isaiah, but Nobody reading Isaiah 7 in the two or three centuries before the time of Jesus, so far as we know, had ever said, there you are, this means that the Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. Nobody had actually read that passage in Isaiah 7 like that before. So it doesn't look as though, and this is what a lot of people have said, of course, it doesn't in fact look as though um, everyone was expecting that a Messiah had to be born of a virgin, so the early Christians made up that story to suit. It looks rather as though something very, very extraordinary happened, and in fear and trembling they went off in search of as good biblical backup for it as they could, and they found that one passage in Isaiah 7. Nevertheless, for the fuller picture, when we stand back from the whole thing, we have to say, yes, this is actually how it happened. And I no more understand that in terms of contemporary science than I understand the resurrection in terms of contemporary science. And this is one thing we have to be very clear about. People have often said for the last 200 years, oh, they believed in all that sort of thing then because they were pre-scientific and they didn't know the laws of nature, which is absolute rubbish, you see. People in the ancient world knew perfectly well that dead people do not rise from their tombs. Um, you know, Pliny said so, Aeschylus said so, Homer said so, all kinds of people in the ancient world comment on the fact that dead people don't rise. And the early Christians say, yes, but on this occasion he did. And in the same way, as C.S. Lewis said a generation ago, the reason Joseph was worried about Mary's pregnancy was not because he didn't know the laws of nature, but because he did. And uh, in other words, they were as shocked by this as we are. They were as ready to assume the worst about this as we are and yet they went on and told that story. And the only reason I can see why they did was because it actually happened. And then when we explore what we need to say about Jesus, we discover that the only truth we can tell is that he really was and is a genuine human being, and that he really was and is truly divine. And that's without adding a second divine being, as though there were now two gods but that he is the human being in whom the one living God has become personally present with us. Now, there's a danger of going too far the other way, of thinking of God just as uh, picking the form of Jesus as my buddy, my friend, somebody who, uh, who, who, who I'm, I'm chatty with, who, who perhaps I obey sometimes and other times I, I don't and so on. And, and that, that's to lose sight of the fact that, uh, that the, the God that we see in Jesus is the same God as the sovereign creator of the universe. 
and we need to hold these two together, not one, not one without the other. Jesus is not part of the problem, he is its solution. And the idea of the virgin birth is setting out before us this fundamental idea that Jesus is not contaminated by sin, but rather he brings the remedy for sin in which we can share. So it isn't that I can start off in some philosophical framework and say, let's suppose for the sake of argument that there might be a world with a God like this and why would he become human and would he have to be totally divine? And We can't do it like that. We have to start off with Jesus, which is always a risk. Not everyone likes taking that risk because they say, how can we be sure about Jesus? And the answer is the same way that you're sure about all the things in the world that really matter by embracing them and by going with them and by testing them out and trusting them. The scripture has many wonderful uh, names for Jesus Christ, but uh, among them is the uh, idea and the concept that he is the second Adam. Uh, the book of Romans particularly has that uh, in its background. And uh, the significance of that is to say that he is uh, a human being as we are, just as the first Adam was, uh, but that unlike the first Adam, he did not disobey, but in his life as the second Adam, he perfectly obeyed. And what Adam, as the first of all creation, lost for us in the Garden of Eden, Jesus, as the second Adam, restores for us and recovers for us in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross of Jerusalem. I like Hebrews chapter 4, verse, I think it's 15 here. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. He really does understand. Uh, Jesus intercedes for us and he knows what it's like to be human. Um, he really can say, I know what it's like, because he really has been there, he really has done that. That is a help for us. Tempted in every way, truly human, and yet never sinned. Therefore, the only person who could take the responsibility, the penalty, of our sins upon himself because he had no sins to pay for. Therefore, he's the perfect redeemer, the perfect savior, the God man, Jesus Christ. And just as you build a bridge by coming from both ends of the spectrum, so here is this unique and wonderful gospel which says the answer lies not in human beings trying to reach up to God as in many religions they do because we couldn't reach up far enough or even that God in his condescension merely reaches down to us, but that God fully enters into our humanity and redeems it and comes at the problem both ends of the spectrum at once. So he is the divine human being, unique son of God, bringing God's mercy and grace to us from that end, but fully entering into our humanity and sharing our experiences except for sin from the other end, uniquely qualifying him to be our saviour. The creed moves straight on from his birth of Mary to the fact that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The creed passes over his life. Then it says nothing about his ministry on earth. It moves straight towards his death. And uh, it's not that his life is totally unimportant or anything like that, but that the really significant thing about what he came to do was his, his death and, and everything at the end. And has that extraordinary phrase, suffered under Pontius Pilate. It's interesting that the creed singles out Pontius Pilate by name. Don't you think it's remarkable that Pontius Pilate, that Roman governor, should find a place in a Christian creed recited centuries later? How strange it is and how bizarre that we have a second-rate Roman provincial governor in the Christian creed, so that every time that I say the creed in church, I mention this man, Pontius Pilate, who actually not many people, even in the first century, had heard of, and how come he's got there? This is the only time in the creed that we make a reference to a human person who is in fact known to us from the pages of secular history. Outside the Gospels, the New Testament, we can find in 
various texts in the ancient world, references to the fact that Pontius Pilate was the governor of Palestine at the time when Christ died. We're dealing with history here. We're not dealing with fiction, fairy tale, real people in real time. That we can place it in a geography and a history in a place and time. Christianity, different from many of the other religions and, and different from being merely another ism, there are plenty of philosophers in the world and plenty of philosophies that people have shaped around a set of ideas trying to grapple with the meaning and significance of, of our world and Jesus is uh, a, a person with a date in history we say that uh, he died under Pontius Pilate and on the third day he rose again those are facts at the basis of our faith that puts our faith in an altogether different category from many of the isms in the world. Coming out before the people, Jesus has come out and he's, uh, he's sentenced him to death, releasing him to the mob. He's going to be um, scourged and then crucified and Pilate seeks to wash his hands in water, but all the water in the world could not wash those hands clean. But one drop of the blood of the hands of Jesus on that cross could have done the job. And so Pilate is a way both of earthing the story, this really happened, and we know when it happened. It happened in the late 20s or early 30s of the first century AD in Palestine, in Jerusalem, but also of saying Jesus did the classic thing of going into the vortex where political power was doing its worst. Pilate was simply the cat's paw of this massive system called the Roman Empire, which crushed everything that got in its way and sent out lesser people like Pilate to do the dirty work. And so many people in the world today, when they say the creed, face similar situations where political and social forces are squashing them and grinding them. And it is a huge comfort for them to believe and know that Jesus himself was in that place where the great empire, through one of its little local henchmen, had actually been responsible for his death. So it's both a historical memory and a very powerful impetus for people to identify with that today. Very interesting that the creed says he suffered under Pontius Pilate. It says he died, but it first says he suffered. The suffering takes any number of forms throughout his life, but climaxes, of course, in the suffering that you see recorded in the Garden of Gethsemane and you witness as he is uh, flogged and then uh, crucified in exquisite form of, of inflicting pain. And all his civil, all his judicial, all his human, all his rights are violated. According to Luke's Gospel, he actually sweated drops of blood. Now that has been studied medically and it has been demonstrated that some people under intense emotional pressure and threat actually can and do sweat blood and it looked as though that's preserving a real historical memory which tells you that Jesus was under the most appalling emotional pressure and what we see in Gethsemane is Jesus as a fully 100% human being. Jesus is not a demigod pretending to be human. Jesus is not saying oh well it'll be nasty in a way but then I'm divine so who cares and in three days it'll be all right. He's not beginning to say anything like that. It's an act of extraordinary faith and obedience to his vocation that he goes to his death in the way that he does. There's the other side to it, and that is the spiritual suffering. Because on the cross, Jesus experienced a sense of separation from God, of rejection by God. Uh, the famous cry at the end, "Why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Part of our human experience into which Christ enters is the experience of desolation, loneliness, and even despair. I uh, led a retreat last summer with some doctors, and we were asking, what's the worst? Is it pain or aloneness? All the doctors said aloneness is worst. People can endure all kinds of pain if they don't feel God has abandoned them, if they feel their relatives are praying for them, being alone is the terrible thing. And for that moment, Jesus asks, what has happened? Am I being abandoned? And to every Christian, that is a sign that he really suffers as a human 
in the midst of all this. So these words on the cross enable us to say to someone who is suffering and in despair, Christ knows what you are suffering. He knows it not only as God, God knows all things, but he knows it also as man. He knows it in a human way because he, in his human experience, also underwent despair. There's another quote from C.S. Lewis which I like very much, which sums up this. It's from the book called The Screwtape Letters, which, as many will know, is a set of fictional letters, obviously, written from a senior devil to a junior devil. Screwtape is the senior devil, Wormwood is the junior devil. And Screwtape says in one of these le letters, he says, Wormwood, make no mistake, our cause, that is the devil's cause, is never more in danger than when a human being, believing himself to be abandoned by God, looks out on a world from which every trace of God seems to have vanished, asks why he has been forsaken, and still obeys. But let's not push the father over against the son, as some would do. It's not an angry, wrathful father punishing an unwilling son. Uh, what we need to remember in the suffering and in the bearing of the desolation is that it's God himself who is entering in to our desolation. God himself who is entering into our suffering. It's God himself who is bearing our sin. He's doing it in the form of his son. But the son is not different from the father, but is God himself bearing our sin. And so from very early on, the Christian church has meditated on the suffering of Jesus, not in order to be morbid and wallow in suffering from its own, for its own sake, but in order to say that when we're in the mess and the muddle, when life gets as bad as it can be, and when I get as bad as I can be, I discover that God himself has been there ahead of me and taken it upon himself. Very central to the whole flow of the creed is that phrase, he was crucified, dead, and was buried. Just as he was truly born a real birth from a human mother, so he truly died. Now, from one point of view, the Christians should have been ashamed of the cross. Their leader died on a cross. It's the most despised way to die in the, in the whole Roman Empire. The creed is emphasizing the reality that Jesus died on that cross. Only the worst people were crucified. Roman citizens were not permitted to be crucified. It was considered too shameful. It was the lower classes, the riffraff, that were crucified. You see, the thing about crucifixion was that it was public. And secondly, that the person died slowly. So crucifixion was always held in a, in a public place. They wanted the people to come out and see what would happen to you if you dared to defy Rome. It took a while, usually took several days. There was nothing unique about that in that, uh, that many thousands actually of, of Jews were crucified by the Romans in the first century. There have been many martyrs in history but it would be a mistake to think that Jesus was simply a martyr to a cause that he didn't know when to stop making provocative statements, that he didn't draw back in time from annoying the authorities of his day, uh, that he was a political agitator who uh, suffered uh, because he wasn't diplomatic enough in achieving his political ends. The leader of the Christian faith died on a cross. The Christians didn't deny it, instead they affirmed it. And Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not a martyr for a cause, but a sacrificial lamb who would bring atonement. We tend to think of the cross as something God did. And I think that's a mistake. The cross is a revelation of who God is in the essence of God's being from before the foundation of the world. The cross already existed at the heart of God's being before creation because it is God's response. It is the love response of God to our saying no. The love of God is shown to us 
in the fact that not only did God share in all the fullness of human life, but he also shared in all the fullness of human death. It says in John 13, 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, to the uttermost, a love without limit. The devil and the powers of the world took over, and Jesus, through the death on the cross, brought us back. Christ has done something for us that we could not do for ourselves. We could not pay the debt of sin, but Christ has paid it and has set us free. My favorite is uh, he has victory over death. Uh, the Apostle Paul liked to say, after Jesus' death, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? Because he now shows by being dead and resurrected that he's conquered death. There is a book of the Bible and a very beautiful book, a very beautifully written book, a very deep book, and that's the book of Hebrews. And it is um, written against the backdrop of the Old Testament sanctuary services. Uh, in this book, in particular, elsewhere hints, but in this book, Jesus is called priest, our great high priest. We read about a heavenly sanctuary, and we read that Jesus' uh, death on the cross was the, if you like, the, um, the fulfillment or the antitype, is the word they use, of all those sacrifices. All that, that whole system was pointing to what Jesus would accomplish. In, in Hebrews, Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is the sacrifice, and Jesus is the altar on which the sacrifice is offered. So, so what the writer of Hebrews is doing is, is pulling together the entire sacrificial system of the Jew, the entire Jewish cultus, high priest, sacrifice, and altar, and saying Jesus has consummated the whole thing, and therefore that is no longer necessary. Hebrews chapter 10, for example, sets out the way in which the great day of atonement in the Jewish faith, which was the annual spring clean, when a, a lamb would be slaughtered in the tabernacle, in the most holy of holies, and its blood would be shed to wipe the sin of the people clean. Hebrews 10 says that happened year after year, time after time. But now Jesus has come. He is the one complete sacrifice for all sin and all time. He is the one to whom all those annual rituals led up and pointed forward. Uh, he is the substitute to end all substitutes and the means of atonement that can never be uh, surpassed. As Jesus approaches in the first chapter of John's Gospel, the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ uh, fulfills all the Old Testament sacrifices that were instituted to take away sin, but could not do so in a full and final way. And Jesus is seen as the ultimate and the perfect blood sacrifice to forgive and atone for sin. So the cross again is God's self-offering, his sacrificial self-offering. Here a very important thing is that Christ offers himself. He says, John chapter 10, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down of myself. If Christ had simply been seized and put to death against his will, that would have been a murder, a miscarriage of justice, but it wouldn't have been a redeeming sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. What makes the cross a sacrifice is the fact that Christ offers himself willingly, that he suffers voluntarily. And this brings us back, of course, to the theme of love. He offers himself out of love. So there I see two vital themes, the victory of love and the self-offering in sacrifice of the Lamb of God. The cross is a revelation of God's very nature, so that what we see in Jesus is the revelation of that cruciform love of God made manifest in human history. Love is the strongest thing in the universe. 
the light of Christ, who loved his own to the uttermost, is stronger than all the dark things in the world, all the dark things in our hearts. The cross is the window into the heart of God. And for John to begin at the end, the answer is that's where you see the real glory of who the true God is. John says, Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, loved them to the uttermost. And when John tells the story of the cross, it ends up with Jesus saying that extraordinary, and it's a single word in Greek, tetelestai, finished, it's accomplished, it's completed, which takes us all the way back once more to Genesis chapter 1, in which when God has finished creation, he says it is complete, it's done. In other words, Jesus has completed the job that God sent him to do. And what is completed, what is fulfilled? The work of love. Luke sees this as the great fulfillment of the whole story of scriptures. It says Jesus explained that this is what had to happen. It wasn't a messy accident. It was God's will from the very beginning in the scriptures. And so the cross in a strange way is the ultimate turning of the tables in the universe. The worst place becomes the most glorious place. The symbol which is the most despised symbol becomes the most glorious symbol. Death becomes the place of life. Sin becomes the place of forgiveness and hope. And Christianity has always consisted of the holding together of that paradox at the heart of the faith. was crucified, dead and buried. The early Christians are all absolutely clear that Jesus was buried, having been very thoroughly killed by the Romans. And incidentally, some people say from time to time, maybe Jesus didn't really die on the cross. I need to tell you, as a Roman historian, the Roman soldiers knew how to kill people and uh, their jobs were at stake if they would let anyone off the cross who wasn't actually dead. There was a real birth and a real death. There is no deceit no play acting in our Christian faith. All is truth, all is reality. So Jesus died, but that's not enough for our salvation. There needs to be something more. He died, but he died as we die. And Paul uses this phrase. He talks about Jesus being raised from the dead. And by that he means that Jesus really did die. This was no semblance, no appearance of death. That wherever the dead go, for example in the Old Testament, it talks about the pit or shield. Wherever the dead go, Jesus really was there. Now the Crete slips in an interesting little bit about him descending into uh, earth or traditionally descending into hell. The early Christians explored what else needed to be said about this whole strange event which was over very quickly, just three days. And one of the things that they talked about was Jesus going to the place of the dead. Now, in the ancient Jewish world, they talked about Sheol. It's, it's an ambiguous word, sometimes translated as Hades or as, as hell. We, we have the idea that hell is a place <laughs> where God is not. Hell is a place totally removed from God, and of course it's seen as a place of torment and fire and all of that sort of stuff. But if we think about it just for a moment, if there is a place where God is not, then God is no longer omnipresent. If there's a place where God is not, there's a place where God is not omnipotent. Because if God is not present, then God's power is not present there. So that causes us a major theological problem with our understanding of God if hell is a place where God is not. Hell here does not mean a place of eternal torment. He descended into hell actually refers to what happened to Jesus on the cross. Uh, that on the cross, he descended into hell in the sense of suffering the, the consequences of sin, the penalty of sin, 
uh, as we should have done. Eternal life isn't a life that you get after you die. Eternal life is the gift of God that you have now. If you haven't got it, you're not going to get it. Christ on the cross experiencing hell on our behalf. But then on the cross, just before he dies, he, he cries out in despair, in despair, because he cannot see beyond the darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus made his bed in hell. And so it means for me that there's no point in my experience where I can feel so absolutely forsaken, rejected, forgotten, alone. There's no point. But Jesus already has been there. I can never say, no one knows the trouble I've seen. No one knows how bad I feel. Jesus does. He's been there. He descended into hell. And a hell that was even darker and deeper than my hell. Then it is said, the third day he rose again from the dead. Now that uh, Paul said, you know, I delivered as the first importance that Christ died for our sins, that on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. We are to look on the crucifixion and the resurrection as a single event. We should not separate or contrast them. We shouldn't think of the crucifixion as somehow a failure that is put right by the resurrection. They go together. The resurrection is, is the cornerstone of New Testament Christianity. The early Christians went around preaching that, and Paul says that if it didn't happen, Jesus, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then, you know, frankly, our, our, our whole faith is in vain and we're wasting our time. So that is uh, fundamental to the Christian faith. The victory of Christ over sin and death is already accomplished on the cross but it is still a hidden victory. Only with the eye of faith do we see the victory. Looking at it without faith, we just see a dead man hanging on the cross. It designated him the Son of God. It proved that he was who he said he was. You see, he had been born, born of, of a woman. And people got around that one by saying, yes, but Joseph wasn't the father. It was all a matter of immorality. He had died. And people said, there you are, you see, that's the end of it. But now he was risen and seen and talked to people, risen from the dead. And the people who didn't expect him to be risen from the dead, it wasn't as though the apostles were standing outside the tomb waiting for Easter morning. They were away quite convinced the whole thing was over. And that's one of the mysteries at the heart of the resurrection, that it really happened, but it wasn't a resuscitation. It was a transformation into a new sort of physicality. Paul tries to find a word for it, and he says it is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. On one hand, when he appears to the disciples, he says, you can touch me. Other times, he seems to go through the door or whatever. Uh, you, you put them all together, you're not going to get a clear picture except that they all agree that this is unprecedented and that this is where faith is born. So Jesus' body has ceased to be a corruptible body like ours now and has become an incorruptible, a non-harmable body, a non-dying body. And so Paul and the others, greatly daring, explore what it means that we will one day have a body like that, which will be in a sense the same, recognizably in us, but in a sense different. And therefore the resurrection is not simply saying something important about Jesus, but something important about our destiny as well. It is that the resurrection is something which you and I as believers will share in. Where Christ has gone in glory, we one day will go as well. And the New Testament, if you read it, and especially if you get it in the original Greek, you just sense here's a document that is just, something is happening. There's life throbbing. And, and the basis of that new life is Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Okay. Death has been conquered. Our sins have been forgiven. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
the ascension of Jesus is not much mentioned in the New Testament. It's affirmed in the book of Acts. Then you don't find it elaborated. Nevertheless, the creed singled it out. Forty days after the resurrection, he ascends into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty in the heavenly community. Christ, who is God from all eternity, who in Bethlehem was born on earth as a man, now returns to the heavenly places from which he came. But heaven is not a place. Heaven is a level of reality. It's not a point in geographical space. The creed is using picture language, which is what we have to do when we are speaking of things that lie beyond our present experience, beyond our present comprehension. In the Bible, the language of heaven and earth work in a very different way, that heaven and earth are the two interlocking, overlapping spheres of God's reality. God made heaven and earth not upstairs, downstairs, but like a different dimension of present reality. And the point of the ascension is that Jesus, still as a human being, still as an embodied human being, has gone into God's space, God's dimension of reality. And the point about that is that one day the two spheres of reality, the two dimensions, will come back together again. The veil between them will be removed and heaven and earth will be one. And in talking about this language of ascension, the creed is saying that wherever God is, Christ has gone to be with him. But, and this is the vital point, he does not return in the same state in which he was before the incarnation. He returns to heaven, to his place with the Father, in his human body. So the incarnation, if you like, is unending. The ascension doesn't mean that he somehow lays aside his manhood. It means that he takes his human nature, our nature, into heaven. His sacrifice, if you like, is accepted, okay? It is approved. He is the conqueror. He sits down on the throne. He has done the job. Our salvation is accomplished. Calvary was the great victory day. It was the the day that ensures the ultimate end of this great warfare between good and evil. So he sits at the right hand of God. He has equal power and he can carry out all of the things that is the will of the Father because his will and the Father's will are one. And by that they mean that Jesus brings God to us. He shows us what God is like. He makes it possible by his resurrection to relate to God, but also that he mediates us to God. In effect, he pleads our cause before God. And that's one of the reasons why Christians may have confidence that they can know that their Savior and their Lord is pleading their cause with God at this moment. The Christian understanding from the earliest days was that Christ would return at the end, at the consummation of history. In the last clause of the second paragraph about Jesus Christ, it says that he will come from heaven to judge the living and the dead, the second coming. It's actually quite a fundamental part of New Testament belief. A very high proportion of the chapters of the New Testament contain some other reference to the return of Christ. Jesus himself said, I will come again. I'm going away, but I will come back. People can be very blind on that. It is something we have too often forgotten. And yet it's there running all through the New Testament. That's where the creed gets it from. Jesus promised his, it to his disciples that the day would come when he would return in glory and take his own to himself. A Jew will often say, you, you say, well, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they'll say, don't be daft. When the Messiah comes, the Messiah will bring peace. He'll bring pre peace. There will be justice. Jesus comes 
And he starts talking about the kingdom already present, with Rome still in the driver's seat, with nothing changed. Look in the world today. Do we see peace? Do we see justice? Uh, obviously, we don't. What's going on here, you see? There's the first coming of Christ, but that's only half the picture. And Jesus talks about you know, his parable of the wheat and the weeds. And, and the wheat are the sons of the kingdom, the sons and daughters of the kingdom. The weeds are sown by the evil one. And Jesus says they grow together until the harvest, until the end. Jesus gives an image not of this age, age to come, but of that age to come of the kingdom breaking in. In his life, in ministry, the kingdom has come. The, the Pharisees ask him on one occasion, when's the kingdom come? Where are the signs? And Jesus said, it's already in your midst. He's already here. When we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, do we really reflect what that means? Of course, the kingdom of God is already at work among us, but we are praying in the Lord's Prayer for the full revelation of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus changes the picture. You might, you might take that, that, that uh, you know, Jewish straight line, and Jesus does this with it. He overlaps it, and the kingdom is inaugurated in his life and ministry, in the incarnation. And now, the kingdom life, you see, the citizens of the kingdom, live right in the midst of the citizens of this age. Or in John's vision, the citizens of New Jerusalem live in the midst of a fallen Babylon world. And so in that sense, the Jews are right. The Jews are awaiting the Messiah, and so are we. The Messiah is yet to come. The universe had a beginning. It didn't just happen. The last word of Scripture says, the universe is going somewhere. History is not blind chance, random. It's moving to end, to climax, to fulfillment. God is going to bring it all together in His time, in His way. We mean not merely a spiritual coming, we mean actually an event in history. And this is what the Second Coming is about. The early Christians expected the second coming of Christ to occur very soon in their own lifetime. From one point of view, they were wrong because 2,000 years have passed. The second coming has not yet occurred. But from another point of view, they were not wrong. Even if the second coming of Christ is delayed in clock and calendar time, Yet, from a spiritual point of view, it is always near at hand. Luther made a, a very interesting comment. He said, if Christ is going to return tomorrow, today I will plant a tree. <laughs> In other words, what he was saying is that my responsibility here and now is to get on with life and the duties God has given me, which is not sitting down trying to calculate the hour of his return when Jesus said he himself didn't know that, but to get on and be faithful and to live here and now. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And as the creed says, he comes to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. God is our judge. God holds us to judgment. When we think about judgment, it's usually a negative word for us. This idea of judgment is something that really seems to be a disconnect from modern people, you know. Uh, uh, judge my, who wants to go to court, you know? It's a world of litigation. We, who, who wants to be there and uh, have lawyers arguing? And uh, for many people, the very idea of going to court, uh, they can't sleep the night before or weeks before, okay? We are terrified of judgment, most of us. So is this a downer in the creed? Not really. If we go back again to Scripture, and I think we always must to understand the creed because it's based on Scripture, we find that the idea of judgment is a positive idea. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people are crying out to God, Oh God, when are you going to judge? Meaning, when are you going to stand up for us? In the ancient Hebrew world, if society was in a mess, the judge would come and take his seat and sort it out and say who was in the right and who was in the wrong and restore the community to healthy, wholesome, functional life instead of messy, dysfunctional life. And so everyone would, phew, that's all right. We, we're put back straight again. Now that's the sense of judgment which comes through into the New Testament as well. We have taken it as, you know, God is going to be cross with us, but it's really not like that. It's if somebody is going to come and clean up the mess, 
The question at that point is, are you part of the mess or are you part of the solution, if you like? Anyone who is a believer in the power of goodness should be very thankful that there is a judgment. Because without that, life would be such a mockery when we look at the things that are going on in this world, there are many of them so evil. This isn't about God being harsh or vindictive. Those in hell, if you like, are not punished by God. They punish themselves. And of course, what the cross re reveals to us is that God grieves over that, that God experiences that torment in God's own being, but never coerces us into restoration, because a coerced restoration is not a loving union. So we're always free to say no, and in that saying no, in that turning of our back on God, in stepping off the edge of that spiritual reality, we experience in our lives the brokenness, the disintegration, the torment, the pain that is the consequence of not being in loving union with God. Christ's judgment is his love, and the standard by which he will judge us is, did we show love? That judgment is not something that is, you know, um, some kind of punitive retribution, but rather it is simply the revelation of our bentness in the presence of that which is perfectly straight. It is the revelation of our brokenness in the presence of that which is perfectly whole. So there will be a final spelling out of the meaning of the lives of all of us before Christ in his presence at the second coming. All of us will be seen in the light of Christ-likeness for which we were created. We were created to be like Jesus. We were created for Christ-likeness. When that perfect Christ-likeness becomes manifest, any un-Christ-likeness -like, un in us also becomes manifest. We have lots of questions as ordinary human beings about the justice of God in doing that. Any human judge sitting in a court of law can only make a decision on the basis of the evidence presented, and the evidence presented will often only be partial can only make assumptions about people's motives, and motives can be interpreted in different ways humanly. But this God is the God who understands us through and through. The thing about the judgment that is such a comfort is God never gets it wrong. Everybody will agree with the rightness of the judgment when it happens. No one will say, oh, it was unfair on me, or this and that happened. No, it will be acknowledged that God is all and in all, and that his judgment is perfect, and shall not the judge of, the, of all the world do right, um, as was said back in the Old Testament. In our case, the judge is also our lawyer. We've got the best lawyer in the universe. Afraid of the judgment? No way. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And that promise that there is no condemnation is one of the most uh, powerful sheet anchors of the Christian hope. That isn't to say that we can in any way be careless about the way in which we live now. The only way to know that we're not guilty is to have made Jesus Lord and to live under his lordship, uh, to exercise faith in him and to trust fully in him. The only thing that separates us from the love of God is our rejection of that love. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, we notice what Christ says to both of them. I was hungry and thirsty, and you gave me food and drink. Or you did not do that. I was a stranger, you took me into your house. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. This is the final criterion of judgment. Did we show practical, compassionate love to our fellow humans? Christ does not ask at the last judgment, 
how strictly did you fast? How many prostrations did you make in your prayers? He asks, did you feed the hungry? Did you care for the strangers? Did you look after the sick? So that is the final test of judgment. Now, when the well-taught Christian looks ahead to God putting the world to rights, the well-taught Christian will say, on the one hand, I am a sinner, I know myself to be a sinner, and so I deserve God's judgment, but because of Jesus and what he's done, there will be no condemnation, there will be judgment, the world will be put to rights and I will be put to rights, but that will be a healing, life-giving thing because it is the Jesus who knows me and loves me who is the judge and through whose death and resurrection I know that I can stand confident before God. We understand um, something of, of the Father because of our experience of Father. We understand much more about the Son because He came. He was a human being like us. But the Holy Spirit, what is the Spirit? Who is the Spirit? The Holy Spirit is, to most Christians, not as vivid as the other two because it's harder to conceive. Uh, you wouldn't use the word Spirit if we're tangible, easy to grab. You see, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit did not come about, I believe, as an intellectual formulation. It arose out of Christian experience. The early Christians were all Jews. They believed in one God, one God. The reality of Jesus burst open that understanding. They had to now believe that within God there is Father and there is Son. And then the Holy Spirit further widens that experience, that somehow, although Jesus is gone, He's still here. I know him. I experience him. And so they call him God, the Holy Spirit. If the Son is fully God, then the Spirit who is mentioned with the Son, he too must be fully God. And also that the Spirit is personal. If the Father and the Son are two persons, and if the Spirit is mentioned with them, he too must be a person. The Spirit is not just an it, an object. He is a thou, a subject. And the New Testament uses other images as well, the tongues of fire which came onto the disciples in the day of Pentecost. And also it uses the image which you get from the Old Testament of the dove, the bird brooding over the waters. And these are all picture ways of talking about this strange power and presence, which is the living presence of God himself, yet it is the presence of the one who is the breath of the Eternal Father and the presence of the Son who is now in heaven, and so in that sense, not with us. In other words, the Spirit is both identified with and different from both the Father and the Son. I take the words of Scripture, especially the words of Jesus, found in the last chapters of John, that, that Thursday night. He says, I'm going away, and you're worried, you're troubled. But don't be troubled. I'm not going to leave you alone. I won't leave you orphans. I'll come back to you, okay? I won't come back in bodily form, but I'll send the comforter, or better translation is the counselor or the advocate. The Greek word paraclete means the one who stands by our side. I'm going away, but someone's going to come. You won't see him, but he'll be there right by your side. Look at Jesus and you'll understand the Holy Spirit. If you want to claim anything about the Holy Spirit, you have to ask if it's consistent with the, the teaching and the person uh, of Jesus. He's the comforter who's called alongside to convince people of sin, righteousness, Judgment. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel. By virtue of the Spirit, we are able to say, I know Christ, not simply from documents, but I know Christ personally. He leads people to repentance that they might accept the salvation Jesus offers. And we can say not just Christ rose once long ago, but we can say, 
by virtue of the presence of the Spirit, Christ is risen and he lives for me, in me, here and now. So the Spirit's role is to make Christ present among us. How the Spirit joins the Father and the Son and joins us to the Father and the Son. And that's really the heart of it, that when we think about heaven and earth overlapping, the Spirit is the breath of God, the wind of God, that comes into our world from God's world and continually joins us with God's world, that sets our world on fire with fire which comes from God's world to transform, to purge, hence the Holy Spirit, to purify, to enable us to live as genuine human beings by being holy as God wants us to be holy. How does holiness work itself out in daily living? A holy people, those who go around preferably in black clothes and uh, never smiling and uh, being very, very careful about what they say and where they go and so on. Not really, no. Holy people are very ordinary people. They're just the average Joe, the average Mary. But they are different people because for them, Jesus is Lord. They have a sense of God's presence. And in fact, that presence, which we call the Holy Spirit, is changing them into better people. To enable us also to live as brothers and sisters with people that we wouldn't normally associate with, to share in Christian fellowship across traditional boundaries. That's hugely important as part of the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit uh, calls the church together. All these people who are converted are converted by the Holy Spirit, who is the animating principle of the church. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Those are Christ-like virtues. Those are Christ-like attributes. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. That is the primary outcome of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, in particular situations, in particular circumstances, in particular settings, the Holy Spirit may work through a person or a group of persons to actualize a certain thing, and which we would call a miraculous event healing, what have you. But as, as Paul says, the, 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 the Spirit is distributed to each one as the Spirit wills, not as we will. Not all have the gift of healing, Paul says. Not all have the gift of tongues. Not all have the gift of administration. Not all have the gift of whatever. I mean, list all of these things. The gifts, the gifts are distributed. We mustn't lose sight of what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 12 that these gifts are given not so that they may be prized status symbols in the lives of individuals. They are given in order that the church might be whole and in order that the church might be built up. And that's one of the things the early church had to struggle with because people were tempted to say, I've got this gift, so I really am filled with the Holy Spirit, and you haven't, so you're rather a second-class creature. And Paul, two or three times, has to go through different lists of what happens when the Spirit comes. So the, those images are all necessary, the wind and the fire and the dove and so on, because the Holy Spirit is all about the coming of new creation, the coming of God's future purposes into the present. The Spirit is the one who makes Christ real to us. The Spirit is the one who makes God's new world real to us. And that's why the Spirit is associated with prayer, with the sacraments, with love, with all sorts of aspects of our life. We couldn't actually exist as Christians without constantly saying, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. The question is, will we become responsive to this indwelling love of God in the Spirit? so that we can begin to live by the Spirit fully, not just you know, God sustaining us in our physical existence, but begin to live in the Spirit, begin to walk by the Spirit, as Paul says. To begin to live in that, to walk by the Spirit is to live in that loving union with God. It is to be thoroughly Christian, you see. And so it's not a matter of receiving the Spirit, but rather of yielding ourselves so that the Holy Spirit can become our life, so that our lives are lived in the Spirit. So after the Holy Spirit, the creed goes on to say that we believe in uh, the Holy Catholic Church. It's interesting that these two are linked. 
very important, I think, because it's the Holy Spirit that gives birth to the church. The effect of the Spirit's presence is to create the church. As Christians, I believe we should all be members of a congregation. I don't think uh, one can be an individual Christian without going to church, being a member, because the church is Christ's body. That's not a, an organizational thing about joining an institution. It's about belonging to the whole community and body uh, of uh, Jesus Christ. The church is the place where we cease to be isolated individuals and we become persons in relation. And that's very important because it reminds us that to be a Christian is not to be a solitary individual. Without mutual love, however correct our verbal expression of faith may be, it is not true because truth without love ceases to be the truth. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, says Jesus, that you love one another. So communion emphasizes the essence of the church as mutual love. As a community, we care for one another, we share with one another. We're a community. Our homes are part of the church. The church isn't prim primarily a social service agency. It has social service functions. It is to relieve the poor, to give a shelter to the homeless, to help the abused mother. Uh, it is not an evangelistic agency, although it has evangelistic purposes to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a political agency, but it does try to help the polis, the, 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 the way the local society governs itself. But the one thing it is, first and foremost, is a place where people gather to worship Jesus Christ. And out of that worship, uh, they are transformed into the people that God wants them to be, and they are sent out in the world to do these various and sundry wonderful things. The creed goes on to speak about the Holy Catholic Church. And each of those little words, I think, is very helpful in understanding more of what it means to believe in the church. When I hear the phrase Holy Catholic Church in the Apostles' Creed, I think of a myriad of things. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that word holy. I like that word holy tacked on there. Very important. Holy? There were those who thought that the Holy Church meant um, that it was only composed of people who were holy. And I take holy to mean uh, in, the in the original Old Testament sense of set apart, something that's sacred, that's set apart for a sacred purpose. Ordinary people, ordinary, ordinary structures, ordinary groups, but because of the association with God, they're called holy. He calls them special, holy. The church, as well as being the body of Christ and the fullness of the Spirit, is also an empirical community of sinful people. So when we speak of the holiness of the church, we are speaking of Christ as alone holy through the Spirit and in the Spirit. And we recognize that though we are members of the church, yet we are also sinners. It isn't a club for those who are cured, it's a hospital or a convalescent home for those who are being cured. And here and now are all of us on the way. The ironic thing is when we admit that we fail to live up to holiness, we're beginning to live up to holiness in a way that the gospel calls us to. Now this word Catholic, it simply means universal. There is one body and one spirit and one faith and one hope and one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And we belong to this one God who we know in this way. And we are called to struggle to work out that unity. Although there may be many Christian denominations, they all have this same basis in the one Savior, Jesus Christ, and the one gospel which he makes possible. People of every tribe and every tongue and every nation uh, belong to that uh, church. We are a church that brings in people from all, every nation, every culture, uh, even you can even say past, present, and future. It's, it completely brings us together. When I say I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, 
if I'm saying that with any degree of integrity, I am committing myself to living my life in relationship with my fellow believers and with those outside the church in a Christ-like way. I am committing myself in my own finite context to being a living cell of that body of Christ, to being the presence of that holy Catholic Church. So it's not just you know, something I ascribe to intellectually, so I'll go to heaven when I die. But rather, it is a commitment to actualize that reality in my life, in my community of faith, in the world. Following the statement in the Apostles' Creed about the church comes this curious phrase about the communion of saints. The communion of saints speaks about the long-standing historical continuity I have with Christians starting back with the early disciples, with Peter and John and Andrew, onward to Paul, onward to Ignatius, onward to Justin Martyr, to Tertullian, to Origen, to Augustine, to Chrysostom, to Francis, to Luther, to Wesley, to Whitfield, to Bart, to Billy Graham, to my wife. <laughs> all part of the same communion. We're all one with them, and that's something that gives us enormous strength and comfort. Who are the saints? It's a, a word that in popular uh, usage has been hijacked somewhat. And so we tend to think of the saints as a special group of people, an elite. When the New Testament writers use the word which we translate as saints, they referred to all God's people. All God's people are called to be holy in Greek hagioi, which translates out as saints. So the saints from the beginning were not some special Christians who were a cut above the rest of us, but actually all God's people. He means to the whole church, to all the believers. So that whether we like it or not, and whether we're a very bad saint, we are still saints. And Paul says that even to the church in Corinth, who were very far from being morally perfect. They were muddled and fractious and sinful and goodness knows what. A saint is a word for a Christian, and therefore to believe in the communion of saints is to say that Christians are called out of the world to join the church as the body of Christ. The very mixed nature of the church and, and the very mixed nature of our own lives, our aspirations and desires for God on the one hand, and the pull and failures and temptation of sin to which we too easily give in on the other uh, means that we, we live in this in-between time. We are saved and, and yet there's still salvation to be worked out in our lives. We, we are sinners who are forgiven by grace, but we are still sinners. The Creed sums up the whole work of Christ on our behalf in in one little phrase, but so precious, the forgiveness of sins. God's declaration to the world is that our primary problem lies in sin. And sin's described in any number of ways in the Old Testament and, and indeed illustrated in any number of ways in the New. It's not just a single or shallow concept, but a, a multivaried concept. Uh, sin is described as rebellion against God. It is described as disobedience. Uh, but it's also described as, as transgression, as straying. Sin can be described as slavery. It's also just being lost in God's world, alienated from him. So there may be uh, an act of deliberate, intentional rebellion against God, or it may be less intentional than that, but still lead us uh, to break relationships with God. So it's disobedience to his law and lostness uh, in his world and sin ruins and sin destroys and our greatest need is to have the sin which we uh, practice the sin which lies within us dealt with sin is not only what we do sinners is what we are but having said that the creed is then making the point that there is a remedy for sin that Christ came to call those who need a physician, who know that they are in need of redemption. Sin is sin, period. There aren't any big ones or little ones. Of course, they have bigger consequences and smaller consequences, but sin is simply rebellion against God. 
And I'm as guilty of that as anybody else is. In the death and resurrection of Christ, there is a remedy for every aspect of sin. And so in the New Testament, to describe the work of Christ, you have a series of metaphors, images. The New Testament talks uh, about, for instance, redemption. Redemption is a word for what happened in a slave market when somebody who was a slave was set free and a price was paid to gain their freedom. They were then considered to be redeemed and we have had the price of our sin paid for us and we are therefore liberated and set free. It, it talks about it as uh, a, a ransom being paid uh, just as if somebody is taken hostage a ransom money may be paid in order to secure uh, their freedom. Uh, so Jesus spoke about him coming into the world not to be served uh, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If we think of, of uh, sin as lostness, Christ's work means he's found us like the shepherd who's gone out and taken the lost sheep into his bosom. If we think of, of sin as separation, uh, fractured relationships, Christ's work means Welcome home. Come back to the family. You're adopted into the family. You belong here. Like the father who welcomes home the prodigal and says, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party tonight because my son has come home. Come into the temple where sacrifices are offered and the language of purification is used and the way in which the defilements of the past, and many of us in our lives feel defiled. We're dirty because of the things we've thought and done. Uh, and the forgiveness of sins means that defilement is wiped away. Or, or come into the family where there may have been disputes and arguments and relationships may have been broken down. Uh, and there is the concept of reconciliation, warring parties becoming friends. And we and God, who'd been on the opposite sides of a conflict, now because of God's initiative and God's gift and God's self-giving, overcomes that obstacle and we are reconciled to him. All that and much more is wound up in this one concept of the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness suggests that sin is, is a debt, a huge debt that we can never pay off. And that then it's like a, this terrible burden around our neck, this albatross. But forgiveness says, hey, the debt is paid. Go free. Cut off that albatross. Stand on your feet like a man or a woman. Walk out into the sunlight. You're my child. Go free, my child. Be creative. Laugh. Sing. Dance. Be happy. You're free. The forgiveness is already there. The question is, will we begin to respond to forgiveness and be restored. Justification means that we are brought into a right standing with God, uh, uh, the position of being vindicated and made just or declared just in a court of law. Before you come to faith in Christ, you're a unified person. From the center of your being to the outermost fringes, you're God. <laughs> you're playing the Lord of your life. And under your lordship, you put in place a whole structure, habits, attitudes, perspectives, ways of reacting, relating to others around you. You put into place a body of being. When you, when you come to faith in Christ, when you respond to the cruciform love of God, your spirit comes alive because of righteousness. You're on the track. What about all that other stuff? It's still there. The old habits, the old attitudes, the old perspectives, the old ways of reacting and re relating to the world, they don't just disappear overnight you begin a process of sanctification. You're on a journey. Jesus told us, after all, to say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And presumably he didn't expect us only to have to say that once and never to need to say it again. That's part of the Lord's Prayer. We are expected to say it on a regular basis. But actually, within ancient Judaism, that fits the pattern perfectly well. If you wanted to be holy as a Jew, it didn't mean you must never ever get anything wrong. It means that whenever you do something wrong, you go to the temple, you offer your sacrifice, you make restitution, you say you're sorry, and you claim God's forgiveness. Now, within the Christian dispensation, whenever we sin, 
we are called to repent, to return to the Lord, to receive his forgiveness, and thus to be maintained as God's holy people, not God's people who never make any mistakes, but God's people who, like a compass needle, when we wobble away, we say, hey, no, that's no good, and we come back. And then, of course, the Christian account of that is that it's the Holy Spirit himself who enables us to do that. So that's what holiness kind of smells like in the present. Yes, we're forgiven sinners. Yes, we're unworthy and so on. But that is not an excuse for saying, I'm just going to sit back and remain unworthy. Uh, we need to follow the path of discipleship. Otherwise, we have no right to claim to be forgiven sinners. And therefore, what the Creed is saying in this simple phrase, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, is that there is something about the gospel that is able to meet the deepest human needs, that is able to deal with the worst aspects of human nature, and able to offer us a changed nature and a changed hope. And that is an immensely important thing to be able to say. The creed then moves on to its climax, and it talks about the great Christian hope for the future. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And the creed is saying to us very simply that to put your faith in Christ is to be able to share in His resurrection. We believe that we are risen with Christ even now in this life, but that there is a resurrection of the body to come. The resurrection is immensely important to the creed. Earlier it talked about the resurrection of Christ, now it talks about our resurrection. The Christian faith, unlike many other religions and isms, does not say when you die that's it. Nor when you die do you cease as an individual personality to exist and so you're caught up in some great being in the universe, losing your individual identity. When we think of the human person, we should not think only of our soul. We should think of the human person as a unity of soul and body. I am not just a soul living temporarily in a body. I am a unified whole of body and soul together. I am my body, my body is me, just as I am my soul and my soul is me, and they cannot be separated. They are two ways of describing the same thing. We are not simply disembodied spirits. We are embodied beings. The Christian faith is a very material faith in many ways and speaks not even about the survival of the soul, which is about Greek philosophy or the immortality of the soul, as if we somehow in the next life will be disembodied spirits. Christian hope was the return of Christ, the resurrection of the body. When Paul said, if Christ isn't uh, risen from the dead, our hope is, is vain and so on, what he was saying is, if all we have to look forward to is a disembodied existence as some spirit in heaven, then our faith is a lot of rubbish. Without the resurrection of the body, our hope is vain, because the resurrection of the body is at the heart of Christian belief, uh, even though it has rather dropped out in much popular Christian thought. So when Christ comes to, to earth, as judge at his second coming. It is our Christian faith that the dead will be raised up and they will appear before the Lord in their bodies. Sometime out there ahead of us, there will be a resurrection where we will be restored in an, in an embodied existence, in a renewed creation, a new heaven, a new earth, or a new sky, a new earth is probably the way it should be translated. It's talking about a new creation. We do not clearly understand what will be the relationship between our present physical body and our resurrection body. But we believe it will be, in some genuine sense, the same body, the same and yet different, because for the righteous it will be a glorified body. Paul talks about in Romans 8 again how, how creation is waiting for this restoration. So that, so that what we're experiencing here in this fallen creation, in these fallen bodies, 
is seeing through a glass very darkly into a reality of a perfect creation with redeemed bodies, restored spiritual bodies, whatever those are that Paul speaks of. God made a good world and it was a world of space and time and that will be redeemed. Space and time will no more have anything to do with us decaying and dying and being corrupted. It'll be a new kind of space and time, but it'll be God's new world going on into new things of which at the moment we can only just glimpse the edges. And we are called not only to share that, but to become its agents, to be people through whom God can help bring that about. That's what resurrection of the body and the life everlasting is really all about. We started with, I believe in God, the maker. And we were there in Genesis chapter one. We come to the end of the life everlasting. We're in the book of Revelation chapter 22. The wonderful thing is that in the whole thing, Genesis meets with Revelation. You start with the Garden of Eden, you end with a garden city where everything is perfected again. So that Genesis and Moses are shaking hands with the book of Revelation and John, and the whole thing is one perfectible whole as the end meets the beginning. The Apostles' Creed is not a set of abstract statements or cold propositions of theology. I hope you've picked up the passion that lies behind these statements to declare that we believe in God, that Jesus Christ died under Pontius Pilate and now is exalted to the right hand of the Father on high, to declare that we believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Catholic Church makes a fundamental difference in life. They're not words that we simply mouth, but the clue to transforming experience and to entering into the fullness of God's gifts for us and the forgiveness of sins and the transformation of personal character into Christ likeness. It's the secret to restoring the health, the broken health of our universe, uh, uh, of our world uh, and uh, becoming the people that God intended us to be. So the question naturally comes as to whether you might say these words merely as a statement of abstract theology or whether they are for you living statements of faith of personal conviction because you have committed your life to the lordship of jesus christ in the way in which this creed invites us to do